Hey there, everybody. It's Nick McHenry, and welcome to another season of Retail Coffee Break. Now, I know we've been gone for a bit, but this season is going to be bigger than ever. We've got huge guests coming on, and what better way to kick it off than with Polly Wong of Bilardi Wong. Now, it's been crazy in D2C world the last couple years, from iOS 14.5 driving customer acquisition costs through the roof, and then D2C brands opening wholesale, opening retail stores. It's just been crazy, and Polly has such an interesting perspective on how to grow and scale a D2C business. So if you're running a D2C brand at 10, 50, 100, 200 million dollars in revenue, there's so much to take away from this episode, or if you're just gonna launch your D2C brand today, still so many good takeaways from this talk. I hope you enjoy it. Let's do it. Hey everybody, thanks for checking out another episode of Retail Coffee Break. I am joined today by Polly Wong of Bilardi Wong, which is one of the world's leading integrated marketing agencies for D2C companies and retail brands. They work with brands like Allbirds, Buck Mason, Our House, Birkenstock. I'm sure I'm leaving off so many great clients, but thank you so much for being here, Polly. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to connect with you. So I obviously just introduced you there, but give the audience a little bit more background on who you are, what Bloody Wine does, and, and all that. Sure, sure. Well, I myself have been uh, in retail for, for 25 years. I started my career uh, 25 years ago at eddiebauer.com and uh, started off in, in digital, and it's been uh, a long ride. Uh, we are, as you said, um, one of the leading direct to consumer marketing firms in the country. We have deep expertise in the online channels, the offline channels creative, analytics, planning. We even work with about 15 private equity firms around the country on the due diligence for the D2C transaction. So uh, we are definitely data-driven, results-driven, uh, like most you know, direct-to-consumer uh, companies. And as you said, we have an amazing roster of clients. We have 400 active clients now, about 90% D2C brands. Of course, many of them have stores as well now. Um, and then we do certainly have a handful of very large uh, traditional retail clients. So the firm's been around for a long time. Did you guys, like, did you find your way to DDC being your sort of core business or That's obviously when you question. started DDC yeah. didn't even really, I mean, didn't really. Well, I, I would argue that um, direct to consumer has always existed, right? Fair. So, I mean, Fair. I started 25 years ago at eddiebauer.com. So I'm not sure it's, it's much different. It just became kind of the, the next chapter of, of retail. Um, yeah, so you know, I the company started as Polarity Ostre, and I was a client of the company. I was at Williams Sonoma Inc. here in San Francisco, working across all seven brands in the Williams Sonoma fa family: Pottery Barn, West Elm, Williams Sonoma. Um, you know, the whole brand family focused on new customer acquisition for all seven brands, and I was a client of the company. And uh, my husband, uh, or my soon-to-be husband, uh, called me and said, "I got the opportunity of a lifetime in New York City," and I was like, "Okay, wow." Um, and, you know, after interviewing with several retailers uh, in New York City, decided to jump ship to the dark side um, and joined the agency then, which was Velarde Ostroy. And when I joined the company, we had about 75 clients. We were focused always on prospecting. That's actually building, on uh, focusing on new customer acquisition has always been at the, you know, kind of what we've been focused on. Uh, but we've certainly evolved. Like I said, we're about six divisions today and 400 active clients. You know, we really just, we've always been in retail and direct to consumer. So the company started as a catalog marketing firm. Um, and as I said, I started in digital and got my feet wet in catalog at Williams Sonoma. But really and truly, I mean, you know, the, the LL Beans of the world are the original direct to consumer brand. So we were already working, you know, with companies that were selling online, selling via catalogs selling in stores, specialty brands is what we called them back then. Um, and so it's really just been a natural um, evolution. And we've just worked to, you know, the industry keeps changing. There's probably been four or five chapters in the last 17 years I've been here. So we just keep reacting and responding to the, the changing needs of the industry. So yeah, that's a really interesting perspective in just terms of how we traditionally identify and kind of describe D2C. Would, would you say that, you know, from when you started at Eddie Bauer until now, would you say that, like, how different has things become? Is it a new game entirely? Have the rules just slightly changed and we're sort of just taking the old, you know, what was happening in 1999 or the early 2000s and reapplying it in a new medium now? 
What do you think there? It's certainly more complicated and more expensive. You know, it was very easy, I think, to be successful. Um, you know, when you were eddiebauer.com and you know, 1999, one of the first, you know, large apparel brands, you know, online, it was very easy to win. And I remember sitting over with the, the digital team and we were the cool kids. So we, we got to sit in a separate building and we had, you know, the ping pong table and the TV and all that jazz. Uh, Cause we were the cool.com kids, you know, this is like 1999 and we'd be sitting there working on our affiliate programs and our email and what have you. And all of a sudden sales would be amazing. Lori, like, look what we did. We're so awesome. And then the original like core marketing team is in the other building being like, but we mailed 5 million catalogs last week. Like your e-commerce <laughs> sales skyrocketed because we mailed 5 million catalogs. But of course we, we, we thought at the time we were, you know, we were too cool for school. We were driving all the results. And of course now we know differently, but I think obviously it's, it's more competitive. It's more complicated. It's more saturated. It's more promotional. It's more expensive, you know, the cost of doing business is just, you know, incredibly high. Um, and obviously, as you know, everybody's seeing increases across the entire PL, right? Rising cost of goods, rising cost of distribution, rising cost of marketing. And so it's honestly, it's a very challenging, competitive, saturated environment categories that were really easy to win in, like activewear, super sat saturated, right? Um, loungewear, swimwear, footwear, right? There's just casual fashion brands. There's a million of them. So um, it's just a very competitive market. So how are you guys advising your customers? Because like you said, CAC is going through the roof, cross is going through the roof, everything's going yeah. up and to the right. How are you guys, are there like lower cost channels? Are you guys choosing a more diversified strategy? Kind of what is your guys' approach to your guys' clients? Yeah. You know, from our perspective, there's really three critical growth strategies to focus on. And um, to get back to your earlier question, what's changed and what stayed the same? These, honestly, these three growth strategies are still kind of, you know, what's really going to meaningfully impact your business. Um, and the first is the way that we see clients kind of reacting to this environment um, is that one, we see clients impacting and expanding their channel distribution. Right. So obviously you see D2C brands opening up their own stores. You see D2C brands expanding into wholesale. They're on the floor at Nordstrom's. Right. You have to be where the customer is at. We even see D2C brands now exploring Amazon. Right. Because she's there. Their customer is there. And so, you know, I always I've been looking at some interesting stats lately. Over 50 percent of apparel sales in the U.S. are still in physical stores. If you're in the home goods category, two thirds of furniture is still sold in physical stores. If you're not in a physical store, whether it's your own store or whether it's the Nordstrom's floor, then you're missing out on literally at least 50% of the market in your category. So, you know, definitely seeing, you know, marketplaces, wholesale, opening up your own specialty branded stores, um, but definitely channel distribution is, you know, one of the major ways we see clients kind of reacting to this environment. The second is definitely expanding your product assortment. And I don't want to like piss anybody off, but, uh, <laughs> you know, the Caspers of the world and the Aways of the world, um, you know, made people think that you could just have one hot product and just suddenly explosive sales and what have you. Um, that's not really how retail works. That's not really how you grow a successful, profitable, sustainable brand. Um, I always tell people there's two things I learned in my days at Williams Sonoma. The first is that the best way to drive response rates or conversion rates is to have a range of products across categories and price points. This is why you see all the hot bedding companies launching loungewear. This is why you see apparel lifestyle brands launching home, right? This is right. why you see companies that are selling apparel, adding footwear and accessories and jewelry. If you give the consumer more to buy, you increase the lifetime value of existing customers and you increase the ability to acquire new customers. And so definitely the second piece is expanding the product assortment. And then the third, of course, is, is constantly activating new marketing channels, right? So, you know, your PC clients, actually clients targeting consumers, even older consumers, having great success on CTV, TikTok. I mean, every day I talk to brands, I talk to about 40 brands a week, and they all want to de-invest in Facebook. And so where are they investing? And they're investing other channels and, um, you know, absolutely seeing, continuing to see a huge surge in direct mail and catalogs. And that's kind of your guys' correct me if I'm wrong, but that's sort of where you guys started, or is your core competency it's is directly at our core. Yes, we started there. It's at our core. Um, my business partner Donna Bellardi and I, you know, five, 10 years ago, we were traveling all the time. We would sit in the airport bars and we would say, How do we future proof our business? And so we hired digital experts and creative experts and analysts and 
Um, you know, so we definitely have incredible amount of expertise, but wouldn't you know it? Everybody wants to be in the mail. We've actually, we have 400 active clients in the mail. So if you are a client of Blarty Wong, you are in the mail. And we've launched over 250 D2C brands into the mail for the first time. Way back when we launched, I don't even know if these are on my, my I can say list, but who cares? Way, way back when, you know, 10 plus years ago, we launched Shutterfly and One King's Lane and Zappos and Hewlett Packard and all these brands into the mail. And now we just keep continuing to launch, you know, specialty B2C brands. Wow. So what, so if, you know, for the brands, you know, let's say like the last, some of the brands you mentioned in the last wave of, let's say, hot D2C startups, the Casper's sure. the world, all that stuff, you know, at the time when they started, I, I think it's pretty well known that they built their business off of the Facebook ecosystem. I mean, literally it was just ad spend, yeah. do the math, how much can you acquire a customer? What's the lifetime value? So what, like I would assume the value prop of direct mail hasn't changed that much. The environment's changed, but like, why should I be thinking about direct mail in terms yeah. of a core of that strategy? There's probably, you know, five or six main reasons why we've seen this resurgence in print. The first is that just the cost of digital marketing, right? I mean, you know, it used to be you, you could have a four or $5 CPM on Facebook. And today you're lucky if it's a $20 CPM. And also it's very volatile based on the amount of impressions and inventory and the algorithms, and the tracking and the measurement. I mean, I can't even get into all the Facebook challenges right now, uh, but definitely the cost of digital marketing is significant. The saturation, it's very, like I said, very promotional, very competitive. I think the second reason, honestly, is that most sophisticated marketers have realized that you have to have a marketing mix across all channels, online and offline, to really drive scale, that you have to contact your target consumer multiple times, online and offline, to really drive awareness and response rates for new customer acquisition. So you've got the rising cost of digital, you've got, you know, this uh, just, you know, understanding, right, that you can't put all your eggs in one basket, in the words, it can't all be Google and Facebook, you know, there's an incredible amount of real estate, right? I mean, you think about the size of a, an Instagram ad, or you think about, you know, a text link or a product ad in Google, right? There's a phenomenal amount of real estate. So for new customer acquisition, especially I should have mentioned, Nick, you know, we do tend to work with premium brands here at mm -hmm. Velarde Wong, targeting a more affluent consumer. So if you're trying to sell somebody a $300 sweater or a $300 pair of shoes, the real estate in print, especially when it comes to new customer acquisition, is extremely effective. I, I know that the next thing I'm going to say sounds really self-serving, but I swear it's true. Direct mail responders have 15 to 20 percent higher AOV always, and that correlates to higher lifetime value over time. If you think about it, you've got 100 percent touch rate. So in the world of digital ads, mm -hmm. we're never really sure you know, uh, whether somebody's actually seen the ads, right? But you've got to touch it to recycle it. So, you know, you get 100% or 99% deliverability into the mailbox and she's got to touch it to recycle it. So the touch point, you know, the 100% is incredible. Um, and then, you know, obviously, you know, no need for third-party cookies. I mean, there's a lot going around in the world of right. uh, data and privacy and online. And so, um, yeah, so for all those reasons, we're, we're seeing this amazing pick back up in print. So how do I think about the next metric down then, right? So it's a hundred percent open rate. Absolutely. You're totally right. You have, yeah. even if you don't look at it, you have to physically touch that, that piece of direct mail. How do you advise your clients or how do you guys think about the, like the ROI? Like, did they, yeah. did they look at it? Do they go in store? Do they go online? The actual conversion metrics around that. So the great part is that, you know, we can do really advanced analytics because it's all at the transactional level. So uh, at Bilardi One, we don't use QR codes or coupon codes. You know, I always say there's too much coupon code breakage in the world, right? Like she's smart. She's, she's right. going to get the best coupon code she can find. She's going to sign up for email. She might sign up for SMS to get an extra 10% off, right? So um, we do a name and address transactional level analysis and, okay. you know, an average campaign might have one or 200 segments in the mail. So you can see exactly how many one-time buyers you convert to two-time buyers, how many lapsed customers you can reactivate. You know, you build multiple prospecting models. You can see how each of them perform, you know, where you want to scale, where you want to pull back. And so um, the analysis is actually quite sophisticated. What we're working on with clients now is to really understand the intersection of marketing and customer metrics and the intersection of digital and print channels, right? So, you know, what is that interaction or that overlap across the channels? Um, we have a client who spends probably about $900,000 a month on Facebook. And um, when we were looking at the analysis, they were quite surprised to see that 
of all that revenue associated to Facebook, only 4% of it was Facebook only. The 96% of it was interacting with some other key acquisition channels. So um, it's always very interesting to look at. So in that scenario, maybe outside of this specific client, of course, but just in general, how should a brand be thinking about that mix? If, if, yeah. I, you know, if I have a million dollars a month to spend in you know, paid media or, or whatever I'm putting towards this, how should I think about the kind of should print, yeah. digital? Yeah. You know, I think at this point for D2C brands, we might of a total budget, you might see, you know, 40 to 50% in digital, 30 to 40% in print, you know, with the balance of it focused on things like influencers and PR and TV tests, you know, nobody runs TV all year round, but you might have clients running, you know, two or three kind of hits, three weeks of TV a couple of times a year. Um, so definitely, you know, we're, we're seeing it increase. Most of our clients mail eight to 10 times a year. They mail at least a few hundred thousand customers and prospects at a time. Uh, that adds up when you think about the cost of a, of a catalog or even a direct mail piece. Do you think, so taking it, if I'm, I'm just watching the trend of, you know, where let's say the new age of D2C brands have gone. Yeah. What is subcategorizes for that? Cause like you said, D2C is kind yeah. of everything, but you know, there's this trend of like you had mentioned opening stores now, you know, if you were a D2C brand, you started only online. I think most of them did take the strategy of what you were talking about of a very small skew count, like your category killers, your a ways of the world, yeah. or even if you're a clothing brand, you maybe had, you know, 10 styles to launch or whatnot in your opinion or perspective. Do you think if these brands had started in a more mixed, diversified uh, realm, like had open stores sooner, had sold the wholesale sooner, had done, you know, print, you know, catalog advertising or catalog media sooner, that that would have had a incremental benefit or is it just catching up to them? I would say yes, if it were not for the pandemic, because obviously retail stores are a huge fixed cost and right. they're a huge investment. And so you know, if you're talking about D2C brands that might have opened up and accelerated their store openings in 2018 or 2019, they, you know, those brands wouldn't have had the kind of financial stability and the balance to be able to support those fixed costs of stores, like really large traditional retailers, which some of them won't make it as well. Right. So right. I think if it were not for the pandemic, absolutely. Like I said, most of retail sales in any category in this country are still in physical stores. And if you're not there, you're missing out on a significant market opportunity. Are you bullish DSC brands continuing to open stores because the DSC brands that you know we we work with or that we see in the media are yeah. opening at I've never seen a store opening at such a rapid rate for some of these brands. Are you at what point is it the right balance? At what at what point do you just lean in farther? Given that that number, like you said, is majority of store sales are happening in store. Yeah, you know my personal perspective, based on all the brands I've seen win and fail at this, is that you know a, a slow methodical approach, maybe five to eight stores a year you know, you really want to think about your markets. There are not as many A markets when it comes to physical stores as there used to be. And so, you know, it's very, very risky. You know, I think the times when clients used to open up 30 to 40 stores a year, I that, that should be behind us if they're doing that. I think that's quite aggressive given the, the current environment. Um, we have a lot of our clients basically targeting for the next three years five to eight stores a year with the hope of landing around 20 stores. They might have three or four stores open now. Um, and, you know, at that point, if you've got, you know, 20, 30, 40 stores around the country, you're still in top markets. Again, when most of our clients are premium brands are again affluent consumers. So it's a very specific market they're looking for. Um, and, you know, I, I think we're going to continue to see that and, um, you know, in the short term and long term. So, in that, in that context, do you guys do or work with your clients on targeting potential locations or, you know, potential cities or, or through, you know, catalog mail through some of your uh, other marketing spend ahead of opening a store just to see kind of like what that looks like? You know, certainly there's a phenomenal amount of data that can be used to model out where the best store locations are. Obviously, you know, even a simple zip code analysis of your customer file helps you to understand where you have, you know, the most target consumers. Um, yes to all of that. And 
of course, you want to warm up the market before you open a store, and then you want to continue to support that market after you open a store. And um, as I said earlier, you know, if you're doing it right, you're yet leveraging both digital and print, you know, to support a market and to support a store opening. Um, we have a lot of store opening programs for our clients. A lot of clients, the big, big retailers, they have what's called welcome to the neighborhood programs. And so even as part of an ongoing strategy, you might be pulling and building prospecting models to continue to reach out to people who've moved into the neighborhood, um, who are the target demographic around that store. And like I said, we, we think about that as a welcome to the neighborhood program. So for something like that, for a welcome to the neighborhood program, because I know you guys are big on, you know, end to end marketing channels, you know, across everything we've talked about, what is it as simple as just your digital channel and your physical channel, or do you break it down into sub channels across those? Oh, of course. I mean, there's, yeah. you know, five or six major digital channels. Um, we have one very, very large retail client, a super high growth retail client. Um, I think we have, I don't know, 12 different programs for them, right? So we've got new mover programs, welcome to the neighbor, triggered reactivation, mm -hmm. happy birthday. I mean, you know, there's a significant number of programs. Um, so definitely when we just say digital or print, we're, we're lumping it all together. You know, we've seen an incredible surge in insert media as well. You know, it used to be, if you remember like the blue value pack, Yep. you know, envelope and you're like, okay, this is kind of targeting, honestly, the lower to mid ticket markets, but now there's a lot of opportunities and in insert media that's actually on the much higher end, right? I mean, that's how a lot of the food delivery companies have built their businesses, just having billions of inserts everywhere uh, to help drive awareness. And so um, print is not necessarily just standalone direct mail and catalogs. It's also shared mail, right. it's package inserts, it's freestanding inserts. There's actually a lot of print. Uh when you think about print specifically, what do you think the balance or the magic balance is of editorial content to pure catalog content? Is there a winning mix? Is it work well for other brands that maybe are better yeah. at it or it's more of their core competencies, storytelling or whatnot? The simple answer is that the saying that a picture is worth a thousand words is true. A picture yeah. is worth a thousand words. Definitely catalogs today, they don't look like your mother's catalogs, you know, there's less item density, there is more storytelling, but through headline copy, a lot of aspirational photography, they look more like lookbooks, whether it's fashion or home, uh, they definitely look like lookbooks, but um, I can tell you that, you know, um, consumers, you know, I, there's a, a famous men's apparel brand that you would know very, very well started off with some great pants and some great colors and we launched them into the mail. And I'll never forget, they, they decided to add some articles and content. And I think it was like, you know, running with the bulls in Spain or something like that. And their response rate for their catalog dropped off by 30% because the consumer is not interested in, in reading articles from a brand. They're interested in shopping. So. Wow, that is really interesting. I would say that, you know, in every marketing meeting I've been to, I would say half the room would say, the, would bet the other side of like, no, this is going to be great. Our customers would love to read about our interest. That's very interesting. Think about it, you know, if, if um, you know, Tom Smith is the customer, he's just like, oh, hey, is, do those pants come in another color or right. do you have any new polos or new sweaters? And if you're a prospect, you know, then, you know, Scott Smith is like, I just want to know what you sell. Like, I don't right. know your brand. Why would I, why would I spend time, you know, engaging with content in your catalog if I don't know your brand? So show me, show me what you want to sell me. So it's pretty straightforward. And we've seen this over the years. A couple times a year, I talk to brands who are like, we want to do a megalog, like they invented it, um, which is a combination of a catalog and magazine. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> we can talk about that. Do you want to drive sales or do you want to drive branding? So, so is that a pretty consistent rule? Like, are there other exceptions to the rule where a megalog or a, you know higher editorial content catalog? makes sense or is it really just like nine and ten times it's just the catalog is ready to go yeah certainly as like a crm loyalty branding vehicle you know if you really want to engage with your customers you know that patagonia catalog is really intended to engage their customers you know and definitely you know if you've got a really loyal customer and you're going to have great results no matter what it can certainly work to have that kind of brand storytelling and messaging and we're purpose driven, this is what we believe in. And so there's a lot of content around that. Um, or cooking brands. Actually, I would say the one exception where it does work to have content, we have a number of cooking kind of kitchen brands, uh, definitely recipes, tips in the kitchen, and those things can definitely work to drive sales for those types of clients. That makes a lot of sense. I feel like I would want to get tips and tricks from my cooking supplier, um, and I would definitely read that. 
So just yeah. closing up here, Polly, I guess, like, what are you seeing for the rest of this year? You know, I mean, obviously the beginning of the year has been, let's just call it interesting so far in terms of, you know, there's been a lot of unexpected things happening compared to last year. It's very different. What do you see for the second half of this year and kind of what are the conversations you're having? I'm a little bit more half glass full than the headlines, and I can tell you why. So we actually started out the year, Q1 was very strong from both an e-commerce sales and a retail sales perspective. Um, across all categories. Definitely there are categories like home that had huge, you know, double, triple digit increases during the pandemic that are having a slowing growth rate. So obviously the rate of growth is not what it used to be, but overall Q1 was really strong. What happened in kind of, you know, March, April, May is really that we just saw an, an incredible competition for wallet share from services and experiences for retailers and brands, right? She's just suddenly traveling, she's distracted, she's entertaining, and she's spending a lot of money on experiences and services. And it was night and day. We saw traffic decline in the spring for our clients. You know, if there is less screen time, then there's less advertising impressions, then there's less traffic. We saw conversion rates decline because of that competition for wallet share focused on services and experiences. And so actually average order size has been up because of inflation and price point increases. Um, but it's been a kind of a very mild you know, Q2. But when you actually look at consumer spending, consumer spending is up. Retail sales are still up. And looking at some of the numbers, you know, it's very mixed. Obviously in June, we still had job growth. We still had low unemployment. Inflation, despite this plus 9% number that's all over the headlines, um, some would say that was a relatively old data point, that it is coming down week over week. Gas is down 30 or 40% uh, from what it was two months ago. You know, again, I, I definitely always like to call out that we're working with, you know, these premium brands targeting an affluent consumer. Do I think that the people buying $300 sweaters and, you know, $100 sweatshirts um, are going to be as impacted um, in the back half of the year. I don't think so as much. You know, I think obviously the chances that there is a mild and short recession, unfortunately, will impact, you know, the low to mid ticket markets more. And that's, you know, that's of course. obviously horrible and, you know, wish it didn't have to happen. Um, but I think the back half of the year, we're going to see we're going to see some pent up demand. Summer has been very soft as well. June was soft. July is soft. But everybody seems to forget that in a pre-pandemic world, retail sales always soften during the summertime because consumers are traveling, distracted, mm -hmm. they're on vacation with their families. And so, you know, from my point of view right now, I, I understand what happened in Q2 and why it happened. I understand why sales are down right now. It's because of just traditional summer seasonality. It's not the pandemic anymore. People are out and about. They're not home all the time shopping online. I think post Labor Day, we should see a surge in sales. We should see some pent up demand. And I am, you know, hopeful that the demand will be there. Yeah, I mean, I completely agree. I feel like uh, there's a lot of other factors too, right? I mean, there's the headlines and there's also like yeah. last year, last year, I mean, from what I, what I know is that it still wasn't a hundred percent travel rate, right? So you still have sort of a whiplash of like, you know, summer's always slow because yeah. people are traveling and now so even more than that, it's maybe like X percent increased from that data point, I would say. Yeah, I mean, there are other things. I, you know, inflation will continue to come down. I understand now that the backlog of ships in the ports has been mostly settled. And so mm -hmm. you're, you're, you know, that product's coming in at a higher rate. Obviously, if there's more supply, we'll see that pricing come down. So there's, as you said, there's a lot of data. I spend about an hour every morning reading the news. I, I, I'm actually, I'm going to hold steady that I'm, I'm half, half festival on this for the back half. I think you have to be. You have to. You have to be optimistic at the very least, even if you're making decisions to be conservative slash cautious. I guess. Exactly. Exactly. Uh, um, awesome. Well, Polly, thank you so much for coming on. You gave so many great insights. There's so many things I think to take away from this conversation. For any um, brands or you know DTC companies looking to get help in these areas, where's the best place to get in contact with you or your team? Absolutely. Um, you can just go to BillardiWong.com and, and reach out to us there. We'd love to connect. And thank you, Nick, for having me. Um, I enjoyed our conversation. I hope you have a great rest of the day. Thanks so much for watching another episode of Retail Coffee Break. Please like and subscribe below. Hit the notification bell. It helps us get in front of more people that are interested in the retail business so we can all grow the business 
together. Also giving away $100 on this channel for you to shop in the retail environment every single month. So please like and subscribe. I would love you forever.